Well, good morning. We are in Acts chapter 13 again. It's a little dark because I have the light turned off. I'm um, sorry about that, guys. I'll try to sit up a little straighter. Maybe that will get me back in the sunlight. Let's uh, recap just a little bit. We started Acts 13 last week. And we um, were introduced to several other first century believers. Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean. Now, Lucius might be the same guy mentioned in Romans chapter 16, verse 21, where Paul is uh, mentioning the people um, who were with him and he wants to have greeted for him who were in the church. Uh, he mentioned in the letter to the Romans. But in this chapter here, in chapter 13 of Acts, Saul and Barnabas, along with John Mark, set out on what is called Paul's first missionary journey. We saw the first uh, leg of that when they went to Cyprus and had that run in with a false prophet by the name of Bar Jesus, whom Paul calls a child of the devil, even though his name means son of Jesus. And sort of what a contrast, you know, you're no son of Jesus the way you're acting, buddy, you're a false prophet kind of a thing. And, and I don't think we should underestimate that um, thought maybe in Paul's mind because he understood exactly what the name Bar Jesus meant. Uh, moving forward, though, from that point, um, Elymas was struck blind. The local um, proconsul comes to Jesus, comes to the Lord because of Paul's um, and Barnabas' preaching. Not just because of the miracle of seeing the, his favorite local magician get struck blind. And in fact, the, in that, seeing that the God that Paul, of whom Paul spoke was much more powerful than whoever it was, Bar Jesus, Elymas, served. Well, one thing at the beginning of this chapter that we didn't touch on much is fasting. And I mentioned it. They, they fasted in verse 3, and they fasted again in verse fast, fast, verse 2, and fasted again in verse 3. And I would encourage you to read a little booklet called God's Chosen Fast by Arthur Wallace. Now, he spells his name different than William Wallace. It's W-A-L-L-I-S. It's an older book. It's in You can probably get it for five bucks and probably in a Kindle edition these days. Um, it's a little paperback, and it will exegete Isaiah chapter 58 because it's not a matter of if you fast. We're Christians. It's when we fast, and, and when should we fast, and we shouldn't get caught up in making it a ritual to the point where, oh, every Thursday we'll fast like the Pharisees did, and that'll make us religious. He exegetes Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58 where God asks us directly through the prophet, is this the fast to which I've called you? Make sure God is calling you to a specific fast before you do it. In any case, that's the book I recommend for that. And anyway, these guys finish the first leg of their journey there in Cyprus, and Elymas is blind, and the proconsul comes to the Lord. And now we're going to read the rest of, um, well, not the rest of the whole chapter. We're going to get up to verse 41 today. And they carry on with this first missionary journey. So we pick up the narrative in Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Now, when Paul and his com company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And we'll stop there for a bit. Because the next segment from verse 16 to verse 41 is Paul's uh, sermon, if you will. And it's, uh, I believe, important that we take it all in one chunk. But in verse 13, they loosed from Paphos. They set sail. They had to. Uh, that's what the word means. They got on a ship. Uh, and there were no passenger ships in those days. They were either on a commercial ship or a military ship. There may have been a rich guy who had a barge somewhere, but generally these folks traveled by uh, pass, uh, commercial ships with the grain and the other commodities. And they sailed down from the southwest corner, if you will, it's not square Cyprus, around and up to what is modern day Turkey. Perga was the coastal harbor city in that area. Here they go. They came to Perga and Pamphylia. Later, Paul will write um, to the churches in Galatia. We have that letter called Galatians. Um, they, they've landed at Perga, 
and they went to Antioch in Pisidia, verse 14. That's about 135 miles north. That's a walk for these guys. It's a long walk into the area of Galatia. And Paul writes to the churches that were founded in that area, founded by himself and Barnabas and himself and um, Silas when they go out together. Perga is in the area near where Tarsus, Paul's hometown, was located. But this Antioch in Pisidia is not um, a familiar town to us. There were about a dozen uh, towns in uh, in the Roman Empire named Antioch in this part of the world. This was not Tarsus, and it wasn't the Antioch where they'd come from. <clears throat> uh, what we're going to see here is a change in the dynamic of this missionary team. Where once Barnabas was the leader, it was Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Now it's going to be Saul and Barnabas as Saul steps up and becomes the leader. Just the natural flow of how the Lord worked things out. Um, and there's no resentment from Barnabas, which just as a good indicator of this guy's spirituality, he was a pretty good guy. So Virgin said it best. He said, it takes more grace than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. Nobody knows the second fiddle. You all know that little uh, gal who jumps around and dances while she's playing the fiddle. Or we all know the greatest violinist who's the lead violinist in the orchestra. But second fiddle, if they're not playing well and not there, the unknown, whoever the second fiddle is, person... Um, the orchestra lacks greatly. Well, what happens here, though, is important, and it's only mentioned. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. John Mark left the group, and the scripture gives us absolutely no details as to why that happened. No reason given at all. But there are several conjectures Christians have made throughout the years. He may have been disillusioned by the change in leadership. I mean, Barnabas was his uncle. Uh, Maybe he didn't like the emphasis on reaching to the Gentiles. Although he was a Christian, um, he was raised in Jerusalem in the sphere and influence of the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the uh, disdain they had for the Gentiles. <clears throat> that was a big thing for a lot of first century believers to get over, as we saw in a few earlier chapters when Peter went to the Gentiles, how the Jewish members of the church in Jerusalem felt about that. They were pretty upset. Maybe he was simply discouraged about the upcoming and dangerous journey through the mountains there in the area of uh, Tarsus, the Taurus Mountains. Uh, maybe he was afraid for his health. As, as we read the letter to the Galatians in chapter 4, Paul writes, You know how in, through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first. And, and that infirmity of the flesh was a real weakness. It was hard for him physically. Perga was known for outbreaks of malaria, and it may be that these guys went up the mountains to the fresh air out of the Perga lowlands where the malaria was to help Paul's um, illness. We don't know. In any case, it may be that John Mark didn't want to get sick. Maybe he was just young and homesick. In any case, it's all conjecture. We just don't know. But we do know this. John Mark was the minister to Barnabas and Saul. You can check that. We just read that back um, in the earlier parts of this of this chapter. And that word minister is the Greek word hyperetes or hooperetes. It's spelled hyperetes. It's pronounced hooperetes. It means under rower or subordinate rower. And it's not like he was playing second fiddle and didn't like it. Let me explain what this means. <clears throat> this is a word that came as a result, about as a result of a Greek discovery back in the days of Alexander the Greek. The Greeks created a rowing vessel, all of them were rowing and sailing vessels, uh, called a trireme, T-R-I-R-E-M-E. -E. Tri, of course, is the prefix three. And this was used by the Roman Navy because it was a great tool. You've seen, like, uh, the Three Stooges Meet Hercules and all those old movies, I love those things, where all the guys are there in the galley and the slave galleys rowing the um, these big ships in the Roman world. Well, in a battle, those ships were not very maneuverable. And the Greeks and the Romans had great military skill. The Greeks came up with a trireme. They made a battering galley, galleon, if you will, where they would run into the boats of their enemies and slice them. But in order to do that, you had to generate a lot of speed and you had to be able to maneuver quickly. 
So they shortened the length of the boat, and instead of having one row of um, rowing slaves, they had three rows, hence the name trireme. Three of them. Three tiers gives you the power needed. The shortness of the boat gave them the maneuverability. And if you were on the bottom row, you were called the under rower. That's where the where the word comes from. And rowers were typically chained to the bulkheads. If that ship was going down, they were going down. But they were chained all day, every day. No bathroom breaks. Let me just say this, because of bodily fluids, gravity was not a friend to the under rowers. And to be an under rower truly was to be a servant. Maybe John Mark being raised in a fairly wealthy family, which he was, <clears throat> just bugged him. I don't know. He was younger, maybe just homesick. Uh, in any case, here's something else to consider. We know that John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. Most people believe it's Peter's account of the events of Jesus' life and Peter not being um, the most academic of guys. Mark was tasked with talking with him and writing down his accounts. Do you remember in Mark chapter 14, verses 51 and 52? Turn there for just a second. Mark chapter 14, verse 51 and 52, says this. And they're all in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is being arrested. And all his disciples had fled. The apostles are gone now. Peter had already cut off the high priest, the servant's ear, the servant of the high priest, his ear. Jesus healed him. They all ran, and there followed, it says in verse 51, a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young man, and the young men lay, laid hold on him, that is the young man with the linen cloth, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And that's it. This little two verse event <clears throat> is squirreled away here in the Gospel of Mark and nowhere do we get any explanation for it in the scriptures well it's an interesting passage to say the least the language indicates that this young man was of an age when young men have reached their potential and strength they were in his early to mid 20s most scholars believe that like an artist painting himself in the corner of his canvas mark is including this cameo of himself in the gospel but whoever he was, he was wearing typical sleeping garments of the period, a linen cloth over his naked body. That wasn't to say he was being saucy if we look at it through 20, the eyes of the 21st century here. Um, this is what they went to bed in. And it's possible that people in town heard this large contingent of soldiers and men going to arrest Jesus up in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not like they had uh, air conditioners going that they couldn't hear. Every outside noise that was unusual, they would have heard. Um, this young guy probably heard the noise, was curious, followed along, possibly, I should say, to see what was up. Yet the fact that the disciples of Jesus, he, he apparently had been following. It's not that he just followed. They're followed. He'd followed for a while. The disciples of Jesus didn't chase him away indicates he may have been someone with whom they had been familiar and who had followed Jesus and was known to them. And he did just what the other guys did. He fled. The young men, he was grabbed by the young men, which gives us an insight into the ages of at least of some of those sent to arrest the Lord. And this young guy in the linen was so frightened that when they grabbed him, he was willing to shed his garment and run home naked, which he did. This indicates great fear. If it was Mark, his leaving Paul and Barnabas then seems, appears to be like a usual behavior for him. He's not the kind of guy who would be confrontational, he wouldn't face up to fight in, in at that age. He was young. <clears throat> and this is only 10 years later. Uh, so he's in, maybe in his early 30s to mid 30s. And it may be that he recorded that account in his gospel as a form of confession, if you will, or penance for um, having abandoned the Lord. And I'm not saying this is what happened. I'm just saying all the possibilities we consider, we should consider this. Because in the end, he shows himself to be strong and steadfast which is good for us in any case, whether he's the guy in the Gospel of Mark or not, because there's always another chance in our walks with Jesus. We're all going to fail at times. Whatever uh, Paul thought of Mark leaving them here in um, Acts chapter 13 there in Pamphylia, um, 
it it bothered Paul to no end. He, it was such a sign of weakness. Paul didn't want to bring John Mark on their second missionary journey, which we'll see in Acts chapter 15. But ever the encourager, Uncle Barnabas did want to bring Mark. Well, Paul was adamant, and Paul and Barnabas had an argument about it and split. Whatever it was that caused Mark to falter early in his ministry changed over the years. It strengthened as time went on. And it's encouraging that we have the freedom to fail in Christ. Not that we want to, and not that we should try to, and not that we should lean on that as, oh, well, Jesus knows my heart, I'm just going to fail in this case. We should try our best. But there are th certain things for which we must be groomed. And Mark was not yet ready for this missionary work. Mark was not in gross sin. He just failed. Um, so he's not disqualified. He simply didn't tough it out for whatever reason. Was he ashamed of it at the time? Probably, but it's nothing to be ashamed of. Just start out new tomorrow. His mercies are new every morning. And I suspect Mark felt shame after this event, wanting to show that, you know, I've grown up. Paul, I, I can do this. I and mean, he's gone with his uncle Barnabas a few times. I'm no longer the guy I had once been. Don't we all have that feeling? I'm no longer the... The person my unsafe family knew before I met the Lord. Here I am how many years later. It's not a phase I'm going through. I am a different person. Where I wasn't maybe a great employee as a younger person, I became a much better employee because I worked as under the Lord. We all have different struggles in our lives. And in, in, in any case, eventually, Paul acknowledges that Mark was indeed a worthwhile servant of the Lord and writes in 2 Timothy, um, only Luke is with me. Take Mark, this is the same John Mark, and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for ministry. So that's a great thing. Things changed in um, Paul's mind about Mark. Well, here in verse 14, like I said, they uh, departed from Perga. They came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down, <clears throat> which was their usual manner. Uh, so they're in this area of modern Turkey. And it says in verse 15, 16 that uh, 15 that this, the reading of the after the reading of the law and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them saying, "Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on." And that was a typical first century synagogue service. It followed a general order. Opening prayers were offered. Then there was a reading from the law, the first five books of the Old Testament. Then a reading from the prophets. And then if there was an educated person present. That educated person or persons were invited to speak on subjects related to the readings. Well, the leaders of the synagogue went right to Paul and Barnabas and said, if you guys have anything to say, time to say it. And uh, they gave Paul the, the customary invitation. He was more than happy to take, it, take him up on it. And now we're going to read what he says from chapter uh, 13, verse 16 down to verse 41. So bear with me as I read through this. <clears throat> then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, and a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. Sis or Kis there is Kish, uh, Old Testament. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, whom do you think that I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. 
men and brothers, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every day, every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. <clears throat> and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. And wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, and was laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brothers, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And Paul ends, and if those are all the words he said, um, without filler words that we don't know about, this is what we have. We just read in a few minutes the whole sermon <clears throat> that Paul preached to these guys at the, the uh, synagogue here in uh, Pamphylia, in Antioch, in Pisidia. So what do we got here? Ye men of Israel and ye that fear God. Look at verse 16. Paul addresses both the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in attendance as distinct, distinct from the Jews, two separate groups of people. And these God-fearing Gentiles, understand, were not religious proselytes. They weren't converts to Judaism. But they did believe in the true God and respected uh, the Old Testament scriptures. We'll see in verses 42 and 43 that he does speak to the religious proselytes, and he makes a distinction there. You might want to look at that as we're talking here. <clears throat> but he's just talking in general to the Jews specifically and the Gentiles there who fear God. Um, but he spoke specifically, he uh, worded it so that those who were not proselytes, the Gentiles who were not converted to Judaism, would understand it was even for them. So he's got the original bloodline Judas, Ju Jewish people and the bloodline Gentiles. And he's saying, this is for you guys. And he first addresses the Jews by reciting their history. Like any speaker <clears throat> he has a point, who has a point to make, he places emphasis on certain details of that history. And it was important that he addressed the Jews first, since they were the ones familiar with God's word. So he points to history and prophecy found in Old Testament scripture. This isn't just like he's rehearsing the generic, everybody sort of knows the history of our nation kind of stuff. He's very specific because their nation, their history is tied, it's written down in the Old Testament. That's of course not every detail, but, but enough of it to know exactly who they are, where they came from. God's calling on them as a nation and the things God saved them from, punished them with, allowed them to go through the troubles, the struggles they had and how God rescued them and had once again planted them in the promised land. So he addresses them first. <clears throat> and in verse 26, he, he includes the non-Jews. And I'll read that. Men and brethren and children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you who feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. He's saying to this group of people, Jew and Gentile alike, this is for both the Jews and the non-Jews that salvation has been sent. It's always, that was God's plan from the beginning. 
So he changes at this point in his narrative from the history of the Jewish nation and to the Old Testament messianic prophecies and how Jesus was the fulfillment of them as attested to by his resurrection. You know, it's important that we learn how to speak to different types of people about Jesus. I got to say, as a young guy, um, I was kind of single-minded. I tried to talk to everybody about Jesus in the same way, without distinction, figuring that was the best thing to do. Um, well, it wasn't the best way to approach. The I didn't, I'm not changing the story. I'm still saying the same thing today. But how I speak to people, different groups of people, uh, is different. If I speak to martial arts guys, I talk to them in martial arts terms. If I speak to people in the arts, I tend to use more artistic idioms and examples. And, and when I'm just speaking to us regular people from all over in different things, we, uh, we talk about the, the life and the culture in which we live. Well, Paul understood this. You know, a clear example of this was, uh, you got, some of you are old enough to remember Chuck Colson. He was part of the Nixon White House. He was sent to prison because of his uh, participation in the Watergate scandal. And he came to the Lord and started a great ministry called Prison Fellowship. When he, after he became a Christian, after he was out of jail, did his time, was going around the world preaching because of his high political standing, you to understand, we're, we are still the top dogs in the world in many ways. We don't aren't morally the top dogs, but politically, um, economically, uh, militarily, we're still top dog in the world in many cases. And people want to speak to our politicians, even when they are disgraced or out of office. Chuck Colson was one such influencer who had that um, position that allowed him, gained him entry with people all over the world. And at one point, he was speaking with the Bulgarian Minister of Justice. Now, he's a Christian. He's not in the government anymore. He's an ex-convict. But he's speaking, and he's articulate, he's intelligent, he's eloquent. And he says that after a few minutes of speaking with this guy, he realized that due to this uh, Minister of Justice being raised in a Marxist society, he wasn't grasping the concept that faith and morality are not economically motivated. See, in those cultures, the, the, the socialist nations that are strictly communist, and that's what it ultimately is, um, they think everything has got to be financially, economically motivated. Well, Colson, at that point, he says that he switched gears in the conversation, and they began talking about philosoph the philosopher Plato and uh, the Russian novelist Dostoyevsky, Dostoevsky, because they had that in common. So he changed his approach. And from that conversation, he was able to lead into their ideas of the biblical doctrines, theologies, philosophies, in this guy's mind, of sin and redemption. And that change in the conversation and going down that path the long way around the barn, gradually the minister of justice got the point. Colson was able to share that about, you know, there's not an economic motivation in faith and morality. This has to be a hard thing. And once that door opened, he was able to share the gospel with him. Now, I don't know if the guy got saved. I'm not saying that. I am saying that we think it's, I think it's important that we learn how to speak to different groups of people, different types of people about Jesus in ways that will speak to them. Well, in his sermon here, Paul makes four main points. And what he didn't do for all those guys who go to seminaries, he didn't sit down and construct a four-point four sermon. He didn't carry stuff like a notebook or an iPad with him, and, and he didn't go to seminary, and he didn't even know he would be asked to speak, although it was a pretty good chance he probably knew that. But he knew the scriptures, and he knew the history of his nation, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So he stuck to the simplicity of the truth of the gospel and was smart enough to know that listeners best remember only a few things in a message. So he had four important points as you go through this. And the first one is that our forefathers were not always faithful to the Lord and often rebelled against him. Well, we'll look at that in a minute. The second point was, it was God who did all the work. The third point was, Jesus is the one about whom John the Baptist spoke. And the fourth point was, and God raised Jesus from the dead. The forefathers had not always, the Jewish forefathers had not always been faithful to the Lord and often rebuilt. And Paul did this gently. Understand, he's not there 
to start a religious theological battle with these guys. He's there because he loves his fellow Jewish people, just as we love the unsaved in our families. He wants to reach them for the Lord. The way he articulates the history, and you can read through this on your own, it's very interesting. <clears throat> Only the Jews with knowledge of their national history would know he spoke of the unfaithfulness of the forefathers and rebellion against God. He politely mentions their bad manners when wandering in the wilderness. Um, in verse 18, and about the time of 40 years suffered he, that is God put up with their manners in the wilderness. He didn't go into detail about what those manners were. He politely mentions it. The Maybe the proselytes knew a little bit, but the Jews there knew the the Fear, the God-fearing Gentiles who weren't proselytes didn't know this. So he's very tactful and loving in his approach. So they wander for 40 years in the wilderness after the Exodus, and they were bad. They rebelled against God a lot. They complained about everything. God had opened the earth and swallow up some of them. He doesn't go into all those details. He just mentions it. Our forefathers weren't always that faithful to God. Uh, you know, they rebelled. They were. Um, they had bad behavior, to put it mildly. And he said, God was the head of their nation. Look at this verse. And afterward, they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kish, and a man of the tribe of Benjamin. God was the head of their nation. That's bad behavior to say, God, we don't want you anymore. We want a human king. And that's what they did. But Paul doesn't word it in that way. <clears throat> he just mentions it as he's making his point. And then he emphasizes that this is all God's work. In verse 17, God chose, God exalted, and God brought them out. It was all God. In verse 18, God put up with their behavior. In verse 19, God destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan and divided the land. In verses 20 and 21, God gave us judges and a king and then another king after him. Verse 22, God removed this bad king and raised up another king and... Um, and after he found, not that he ever lost David. In verse 23, God promised and raised up unto Israel a Savior by the name of Jesus. In verse 26, and God brought forth this salvation. God sent. In verses 30 and 34 and 37, God raised Jesus. Verse 33, God fulfilled and begat. In verse 35, God did not allow decay happen to to happen to Messiah's body. In verse 39, God justifies. And in verse 41, God works. It's all God, God, God did this, God did that, God did everything. All we did was complain and ask for something else. And this survey of Israel's history demonstrates that God, number one, has a plan for history for everybody, by the way. And we need to sense a connection to that plan because as believers and grafted into the vine of Israel, we are part of it now. And Jesus is the goal of history. And because we are in Jesus, we are in the flow of God's great plan of redemption. We're all part of that. We are tied to the ancient of days by virtue of the work God did in the finished work of Jesus Christ when he gave us graciously our salvation. Paul's third point was, Jesus is the one of whom John the Baptist spoke. And the way he words it here, he says in his, um, verse 24, And when John had first preached before his coming, before the coming of Jesus, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And he speaks as if they were familiar with the ministry of John the Baptist. They were. John the Baptist, who'd never done a miracle, was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus said, no man born of woman had ever been greater than John. And then what we've got here is uh, we've got Jesus showing up on the scene. John saying, I fulfilled my course. Who do you think I am? Verse 25, I'm not he. Behold, there comes one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loosen. Now that's, to you and I, that seems humble. It is humble, but let me say why we think John worded it that way. In those days, many of the rabbis had followers, disciples. That's what the word disciple means, learner. They would follow along, take care of the teacher, and as the apostles and others followed Jesus and took care of him, 
and they would minister to him in many ways. And they would go so far as to unlatch his sandals and wash his feet, the feet of their pet, their teachers. But the past, the teachers, these rabbis, uh, it became abusive with it. They insisted on their disciples doing such things. They insisted that it get uh, they take be taken care of in every possible way. So much abuse was happening that the Jewish hierarchy decided to clamp down and say, no, 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 no. Your, your students are not to wash your feet. That's too lowly a job for your students. And John the Baptist is saying in the to the culture, and we often talked and argued with the religious leaders, or at least had, um, I don't know their arguments, but certainly debates, little mini debates with them at times. He says, there's one coming after me whose shoes I am not worthy to unlatch. And John was seen as a great prophet. Even though they weren't crazy about his methods of baptism, the Jewish leadership, John was not un-Jewish in their mind. He, he was observant. He didn't break Jewish law, so they didn't have a gripe with him that way. And for this great prophet to whom many people flocked, many, many people, that's really what bugged the Jewish leadership. He had John the Baptist had more followers even than they <clears throat> at one point in his ministry until Jesus came. John, this great prophet, is saying, there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not even worthy to unlatch. I'm so low, I, I shouldn't even be the slave to unlatch his shoes. So he's really laying it on to them there. And then his fourth point was that Jesus rose from the dead. But God does it all. God provides the salvation. He provided the Savior. He provided the sacrifice. He provided forgiveness. He provided the plan. He provided grace. He provides sanctification, justification, glorification. He provides heaven to those who do not deserve it, which, by the way, is everybody. And we see in Paul's emphasis on God doing all the work on, in the Old Testament that unmerited grace and being brought into the promised land, which is a foreshadowing of heaven, was all God's doing indicating to us that the New Testament doctrine of salvation, that is, getting to heaven by the finished work of Christ, who is God in the flesh, was God's plan all along. It isn't something new. It's Old Testament theology. It's New Testament theology. It's Bible theology. It's a steady story, straight line from Genesis to Revelation. And there's no different difference in the plan. It's always the same. And any religious system, even a Christian denomination that teaches that you can earn heaven, is at odds with the entire Bible. So Paul's doing this. Did his emphasis on God doing all the work have any impact on the people who heard him? Because we're just going through the book of Acts here. We're not, we're gonna, not going to tear apart every doctrine or we're going to be here forever. In verse 24 and 25, when he spoke to them about... Um, who John the Baptist was, uh, understand this. They knew who John was because he preached repentance to the Jewish nation before Jesus arrived. And this is an important point. It shows that the Jews of the first century, when John was working and doing his ministry, in spite of the fact that they were observant Jews, fulfilling the law as they understood it, obeying the scriptures as they understood them. They were not spiritually pure enough to receive Messiah, so John was out preaching to them, you must repent. And that was a big sticking point for the religious leaders. And then in verse 26, Paul says, and although I've said this to my Jewish friends, he says to this specific group, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, those are the Jews, and whosoever among you fears God, whoever else was in attendance who fears God who were not Jews, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Which means the salvation God promised was for both the bloodline of the Jews and the bloodline of the Gentiles from the beginning. And we have to remember this for ourselves. If God placed us in a con and not only that, the message they heard that day, it was for them to hear, those specific people in that location. If God has put us in a congregation anywhere, and the speaker or pastor is spirit-filled and sharing with us the truths of God's word, then it's specifically to us that that particular message 
is meant to be delivered and for whom the message is meant. And whether we agree with the speaker's style or accent or whatever other earthly thing presents itself as a stumbling block to our minds, we are being handled or handed a spiritual meal put together specifically for us. Talk about a diet plan that's tailored to your uh, specific spiritual needs. God does that. So when we're in these meetings, and I'm not saying that because you guys have to listen to me. I'm just saying for all of us, we should receive what is said. We should filter it through God's word as we test the spirits. The, the word of God tells us to do that. Um, and as, as the, the, the saying goes in Christendom, uh, chew up the meat and spit out the bones. The bones are the opinions of the people speaking and things that aren't in line with scripture, maybe outside stories. In order to filter things, though, through God's word, we must know God's word, which tells us the importance of Bible, personal Bible study. It's crucial. In verse 27, Paul tells these guys about the religious leaders in Jerusalem. He's telling these people in Antioch and Pisidia um, that those who dwell at Jerusalem and the rulers, because they did not know him, Jesus, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. He's saying straight up the religious leaders in Jerusalem didn't recognize the Messiah when he came. And although they read the, the prophets every Sabbath day and allegedly study them every day and are allegedly the professionals and the best educated men in the world in the Old Testament prophecies of God, they didn't know the voices of the prophets. They weren't hearing it. They were seeing words on a page and not getting it. And their lack of understanding the Old Testament, which they read every Sabbath, which is the word of God, in that lack of understanding, they fulfilled the very prophecies concerning the mistreatment of the Messiah, which led to Messiah being condemned by the very religious leaders who claimed to be waiting for him. The bottom line being that the prophecies concerning how Messiah would be treated were not understood by the men most educated in God's word and among God's chosen people. And we're blessed to be living it in the times of the Gentiles, as the scriptures put it, when the Holy Spirit is poured out on us and gives us so, so much insight and has given us the written word of God. Every How many copies do you have in your home? Not every Jew had a copy of the Torah. Certainly they didn't have a copy of the whole Old Testament. How many scrolls would that have taken for them to have? But these religious leaders at Jerusalem rejected and killed Jesus, not because they didn't hear the message of the prophets, but because they didn't understand the message of the prophets. And even though these religious leaders, these religious people heard the scriptures read every Sabbath, sometimes more than once a week because they studied, they didn't understand what was being read. So while gathering together with God's people is commanded of us in the New Testament, corporate gatherings of hearing God's word read without proper exegesis and down-to-earth real-life application means the hearers are not learning and understanding. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I know that I take that seriously, and I know that the men whom I respect and work with and fellowship with and hold accountable, hold, hold me accountable in ministry, we all take that seriously. And we take our cue from the Old Testament in Nehemiah, where the people stood for hours and the word of God was read to them and made known to them plainly what it meant. That was Old Testament before it devolved into synagogue worship with nice little stories of, around the word of God. The word of God was exegeted early on when the people came back after the Babylonian captivity. And even from that time to the time of Jesus in those several hundred years, it, it was gone. We have to be aware that merely going to a religious service and listening to what is said doesn't mean we will know what is meant. We'll understand it. And Paul here is saying to, about the religious leaders, the men who supposedly study the Word of God, how much, if they don't understand it, how much less do the laity understand it? That must have been troubling to him as a man. Now you contrast that with when we get to Acts 17, he's going to speak to a group of guys, uh, believers in Berea. Um, Jewish men in Berea, Acts 17, 11, they were more noble than the people in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. 
So when we pastors tell you, open your Bibles and verify what we're saying, we mean it. These men in Berea who will be commended, we'll look at this again when we get to 17, they searched, literally it means scrutinized and investigated and examined the Word of God to see if what Paul was saying was true and comparing it to the real world things that they were hearing, the eyewitness testimony of the resurrection of Christ. This is constant input versus irregular contact with the Word of God. These, the religious leaders in the first century had the attitude of, oh, I know what the Bible says, when they really weren't as familiar with it as they thought. <clears throat> and in that attitude, they were fulfilling the prophecies of the prophets, but didn't realize it because they weren't familiar with the prophecies. In verse 29, Paul says, And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him and down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. By mentioning the tree, Paul is referring to Deuteronomy chapter 21, which passage says that God curses a person who is hanged from a tree. And God is, or Paul is communicating to them the idea that Jesus was cursed so that we could be blessed. You read, we'll read about that when we get to Galatians again. But then the great, one of the greatest phrases in the Bible, you, you can't see it enough times in verse 30, says, but God. Oh man, the grace of God. Oh man. Man did his best to fight against God, even to kill the Son of God. But God was greater than man's sin and rebellion. So Jesus rose from the grave, defeating sin and death for every one of them, for all of us. And Paul here states the fact of the resurrection simply. And he was many days seen of them. He was raised from dead and many people saw him. <clears throat> he doesn't go into many details, but he does add that that evidence from eyewitnesses was available. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee. Now notice this, that Paul focused on things that actually happened, not merely on philosophy or even theology, because that can just be uh, debatable. But when the theology becomes real and happens in the world, when the truth of it is borne out in the lives of people, we understand this about Christianity. We are not Christians in, the, in practice, or I should say practice alone. Christianity is not just a philosophy or a set of ethics, though it involves those things. Christ, Christianity is essentially proclaiming the facts that concern what God has done. And there are facts. Jesus was here, Jesus lived, Jesus was crucified, Jesus died, Jesus was buried for three days, and Jesus rose again from the dead. What that meant is the philosophy and the theology, but the facts are true that, actually, that he actually went through those physical things here on earth. And so in verse 33, he mentions that God has fulfilled the same in us as children. He raised up Jesus. And he mentions Psalm 2. And that's important. When a good speaker will also indicate which portions of his message or his opinion. Like earlier today, I said this is conjecture because we just don't know. <clears throat> Paul will write later in his letters. He'll be writing all this theology and then he'll say, but that's not God speaking. This is my opinion. Um, but the message of a spirit-filled speaker should predominantly consist of God's word and the things we find in it. And in this case, case in point, Paul mentions Psalm 2 with which his hearers were familiar. And I love that he calls it the second Psalm, and we'll get to that in a minute. Paul's theology here is tremendous. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, he plainly states that Psalm 2 is God speaking to his own son, and that son is Jesus. This is not something Fran made up or preachers and pulpits made up or Christians made up to be different from the Jews. This was an exegesis of one of the most educated Jewish rabbis in the history of Judaism under, who learned at the feet of one of the most respected and well-learned rabbis in Judaism saying this about Psalm 2. And he says to us this specifically refers to Messiah's resurrection rather than his birth. He had been declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Paul will write that in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. The fact that he calls it the second psalm is good for those of us who enjoy Bible history because we talk with a lot of naysayers. What this tells us is that the chapter divisions in the book of Psalms are not a product of medieval scholars, but they were there from the beginning. 
they all knew the first psalm as the first psalm and the second psalm as the second psalm and the third psalm as the third psalm and so on. This is not new. In verse 34, Paul goes back, comes back with scripture. He mentions Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3. Incline your ear and hear uh, unto me and hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. And this is God speaking again to Messiah. Then in verse 35, scripture again. Psalm 16, 10. Paul did not rely on Scripture alone, even though he's saying these things. Understand that. He relies on the observable truth and solid thought that was available to them. It has to jive with Scripture, and he points out to his hearers that after David served God, and, and Psalm 16.10 here, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption, couldn't have been spoken of David. David died after he served God. His body rotted, so it couldn't have been spoken of David. So he points to the obvious conclusion for his hearers that since it couldn't be David and Jesus rose from the dead and didn't see corruption, it was prophetic of someone other than David who is Jesus. He was speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but he whom God raised again saw no corruption, verse 37 here. And by the same token, Paul doesn't leave them hanging, only with knowledge of fulfilled prophecy. That's important. But in verse 38, he says, But be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. He reminds them, he ties all together the Old Testament prophecies with the Old Testament promises of God concerning forgiveness of sins, reminding them that the law of Moses did not justify all the sins that they committed. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Because these rabbis, these Jewish rabbis, who, and the proselytes who were learning from them, were focused so much on the law, they were seeing, they were missing the forest for the trees. Be it known unto you, well known, that forgiveness of sins comes through Jesus Christ. And know it well, because of who Jesus is and what he did for us. Forgiveness, he goes on through to verse 41, you despisers, etc., <clears throat> is offered to us freely in him freely in him we may be justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law and all that believe verse 39 are justified from all things belief not works belief this is no new testament and old testament theology genesis chapter 15 speaking of abraham and he believed in the lord and he god counted it to him abraham for righteousness Abraham was counted righteous because of belief, not because he tried to sacrifice Isaac or was willing to, not because of any other thing, but then he believed the promises of God. Salvation by works has never been God's plan. It's always been faith, not works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no man should boast. And then Paul points them to Habakkuk, verse, here, verse uh, 40 and 41. Beware, therefore, that lest you this come upon you which was spoken of in the prophets, behold, ye despisers, and wander and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Though a man declare it unto you is not how it's worded in your King James. This is the Septuagint reading the Greek Old Testament. Uh, that Paul is referring to. He does that frequently. And here's the point. Look among the nations, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, even though it were told to you. Though a man declare it to you, Paul preaches here from the Septuagint. He clearly teaches that the man referred to in this prophecy is Jesus and the others who will come sharing that story. Based on what I just told you, he says to them, Beware that you do not become the despisers mentioned in this prophecy who did not believe the work uh, of God did because you've heard it from a man. And he warns his listeners not to make the same mistake as the religious leaders in Jerusalem. You guys are sitting up here in Antioch and Pisidia, and you think they're the Mecca down there, and there wasn't any Mecca in those days. You think they're the big Jesus because they sit in Jerusalem. If they do reject Jesus the Messiah, 
If you guys do this, you will be in danger of being included among these despisers who, as he says, wander and perish without accepting. And then they will be the fulfillment of Habakkuk 1.5. The Jewish religious establishment, they, they despise Jesus. They refuse to call him by name. We saw that through the early part of the book of Acts and even in the Gospels. They wondered at the miracles he performed because they saw them and believed them. They wondered at the wisdom and knowledge he had of Old Testament scripture. Yet, because they only wondered and despised him and didn't believe him and didn't believe what God's word said about him. And then in that belief repented out of their hard hearts. They didn't do any of that and accept Messiah. They would perish. And Paul told these Jewish guys in Paphos, don't be like those guys. Beware that your unbelief doesn't become permanent. He's saying to them, I know you're wrestling with these things. And we'll look at that at some point. Some refuse to embrace the salvation of Jesus in that secret place in their heart because they want a salvation of their own making. And those who were raised in a religion based on works, I was, I was a Roman Catholic. Um, I just threw up my hands in disgust and said, I can't be good enough to go to heaven. So I didn't forget this religion stuff the jews of the first century especially the religious leaders who were uh the heart you know the, the place where all that resided the, they they had the scriptures they had the rituals they were the ones teaching it how could they face what paul and others were saying what jesus was saying without having tremendous turmoil and thinking to themselves we've been doing this for centuries how could we have been so wrong for so many years we think you're the wrong one you're crazy they said to Jesus. So what's in this for us? Verse 39. All that believe are justified from all things. Justified. A word that means rendered and declared innocent, free, righteous. Justification. Uh, people think of it in this case, just as if I didn't sin. And when we read through Paul's epistles in Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, we'll see this. Romans 3, 19 and 20 says, Now we know that whatever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's what the law does. It makes us all guilty. The law can only tell you when you're wrong and you break it. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 10, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have su not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. They went and established their own righteousness. That's religion, folks. When we create a method of reaching God out of our own creation, this is religion. This is man trying to reach God. We can't do it. In doing that, we do not submit ourselves to the righteousness of God. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God, according to Paul's writings in Galatians. In fact, he quotes Habakkuk then, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. The same verse that threw Martin Luther into beginning the Protestant Reformation. Galatians tells us that the, school, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we would be justified by faith, that we can't live up to it. It was a measuring stick so tall that going up against it daily, day in, day out, year in, year out, had to show you that I never measure up. Yeah, that's the point. You need a savior. And he says in Galatians, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever ever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Fallen, driven off course, dropped away from grace. Uh, the sense is of a lower than available level of life. And then you've got whole religions like the Roman Catholic Church who teach you that you have to be in a state of grace and you have to work to get there. But God's word says you can't possibly have grace. You've fallen from grace because you're relying upon the law. You've rejected Christ. He's become of no effect to you because you are leaning on the law and not on Christ. You can't be in a state of grace apart from Christ. You can't be in a state of grace by leaning on the law. If you do the saving, you get the glory. If Jesus does the saving, he gets the glory. Isn't that the point? And look what he says here. And he rewards them that do, that do, that do good works, right? No. He says he rewards them that diligently seek him. 
Hebrews 11, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God. For he that comes to God must first believe that he exists, and that he rewards them that diligently seek him. Not them that work, but them that diligently seek him. And diligently seek him is one Greek word which means to search out, to investigate, to scrutinize, to beg for oneself, to crave, to require. Do you require God? I do. There's nothing in me that would qualify me for heaven. No matter how long I walk. In fact, the more I walk with the Lord, I don't even know why he lets me. The more I learn of myself. Nothing here is about good works. Nothing in the Bible at all speaks to seeking God for God himself for one's own self. It's an internal search that, uh, of the heart that he's speaking of here with corresponding outward investigation and living. We're not investigating if we're doing good works. We're trying to earn. We should live a good and righteous works filled lives, but it should come from a heart that is seeking God. So where does one investigate God in the sense of seeking truth about him? By studying God's own words to mankind to see if he's on the level. And let me tell you, he is. Let's pray. Father, what a blessing your word is.